In this video we're going to run through about a 30 minute guide to the enhancements that were made to both VCarve Pro 7.5 and Aspire 4.5. We're going to start by working through the features that are common to both programs. We're going to use VCarve Pro to do that. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to go into Aspire to show you the modeling specific changes. It's important to note that if you're running VCarve Pro 7 or Aspire 4, then these are both free upgrades. You can access them by going to help and check for updates as you see me do on the screen here and that will let you access the patches in order to patch the programs directly on your PC. So let's go ahead and create a new file. I'm just going to set this to be 12 by 12 and hit OK and demonstrate a few of the changes to the drawing side of things. First of all there's a nice enhancement to the snapping. If we come over and click on draw a polyline Previously, we could only snap to existing objects, other vectors and things like that. Now we have the ability to snap to certain positions in the job setup. And these are the corners. So you see if I move the cursor down there, it changes when I get over the corner. Any of the midpoints on the side or the top of the job or also in the center of the job as well. You can see that change there. So this is nice because quite often you want to start drawing or create a shape that's in the centre or on one of the corners. In this case here I might want to click to sketch the first part of my polyline there. Come down and snap to the midpoint at the bottom, the corner, the midpoint along the side here. And then another nice um, change here is when I'm creating a polyline like this, I now have the ability to automatically close the polyline and then stay in the tool to create other lines if I want to. We can do that by hitting the tab key on the keyboard. So if I hit tab, you'll see that that will just close that off. It just goes from the last point that I created, closes off the shape with a straight line. And now if I wanted to, I could continue drawing other shapes with the tool. Another nice update when you're editing objects or nodes on a vector is the ability now to specify a specific nudge distance. Previously, how much you nudged an object with the arrow keys on the keyboard was just determined by how far you were zoomed in to the job you were working on. Although that was very good for positioning things and just jogging them around, it meant that you didn't know exactly what coordinate the object was located at. Now, if we go up to Edit and down to Snap Options, which I can also access by hitting F4 on the keyboard, at the bottom of the form we have this option for a fixed nudge distance. If I enter a value here, say half an inch, hit OK, then select an object, I need to hold down Shift and Control on the keyboard to activate that, and then if I hit any of the arrow keys, so if I hit the right arrow key, that I know now has been nudged over exactly half an inch. If I hit the up arrow key, I know that's been nudged up exactly half an inch. This also works for nodes. If I go into node editing, select this node here, and then again hold down Shift and Control to access that specified distance, and again hit the arrow key over to the right uh, or up, then I know that that node has been nudged, nudged over to the right by half an inch and up by half an inch as well. We can right mouse click on that, go to the properties and see that in total that node's now moved over an inch from where it was previously because we've moved the shape over and moved that node up and over as well. Opening the node properties also shows us another change here, and that's the ability now to move a node to an absolute position, which is the previous um, choice that you had in VCarve Pro and Aspire, or by a relative amount. So again, in this case, if I want to move it from its current location, um, but I want to move it exactly 3 eighths of an inch uh, over in X, and maybe um, half an inch up in Y, then I can do that and it'll move it relative to its current position, whereas before I'd need to know the exact coordinate that I wanted to move that node to. Next feature I want to demonstrate is a really useful enhancement to the rotate tool. I'm just going to come over and click and draw a star here in the middle of my job and I'm going to select that vector, click on the icon here to rotate selected objects. 
and you'll see that the form for this command now is a little different there have been some additions to it and also you can see this kind of circle within a circle uh, that is in the center of the bounding box for our star now previously this would have been the default position and the only choice when we rotated an object around so if I clicked on here it'll rotate around what is the center point of the bounding box now we have some options to select either any of the corners of the bounding box as our rotate position and notice that circle within a circle is moving there or I could put that back to the center and as well as selecting from here or entering a specific value I can also click and drag this around as well so you can see the default here as it would have been previously if I click and drag then that's not really rotating around the geometrical center of the star. As I say, it's rotating around its bounding box. So it kind of gets out of position as you rotate it around here. If I just undo that now, we have got a snap position at the geometrical center of a star in VCarve Pro and Aspire. So I can now click and just drag until that snaps there. And now if I click and drag, you can see I'm actually rotating that about what we would think of as the geometrical center of the star. Again, if I just undo that, I've also got the potential to click, drag and snap that to anything else. So if we wanted to rotate around that corner, for instance, we can do that or it's possible to just drag this to a completely arbitrary position or to snap to another piece of geometry as well and then rotate around that. If we just keep undoing that back to the um, original there. At any point, if I've dragged this way off and I can no longer see it, I can either click on the um, form here to put it back to its uh, natural center or I can actually click on the center in the 2D view here and that will return there to the default. So if you've been rotating something it will re re remember the center that you specified so if you ever want to reset that you can just use either of those methods. This ability to drag and specify a center point for rotation has also been very handily added to the create a circular array command as well. So if we just close out of the rotate option here, I'm just going to shrink down our star and we'll just drag that into a sort of an arbitrary position. So I have no idea where the center point of this is. Next I'm just going to click and create a circle here and then we'll just drag that up vertically by holding the shift key down. Now previously if I'd wanted to make a circular array around the geometrical center of that star I would have had to draw some additional geometry and interrogate where that was, write the coordinate down and then enter it manually. Now what's nice is we can come into the create a circular array of copies command here. I can select the object in this case and we'll just click on it again and now you can see that we've got our double circle that allows us to specify the center point here and I'm just going to click and drag that down and snap that to the geometrical center of my star. We'll put in 15 objects here around a circle and hit copy and you can see I know that now a perfectly circular arrayed around the center of my star there even though I have no idea what the actual coordinate of that is. Now if we wanted to we could grab these and hit F9 to center those back in the middle of the job. So moving on to another new tool that's been added to the vector creation options in VCarve Pro and Aspire. I'm just going to open a file here where I've created some text and an oval and some stars. And this might represent a job where we want to go ahead and machine around the text and the stars. So in effect, create a pocket around those, but then cut out the perimeter of all these vectors. Now, previously, I'd have had to do a variety of welding in order to create these. Now we have a nice command that will take a set of overlapping vectors like this and automatically create a boundary vector. And there's a few different modifiers within that. The icon for this is here under Edit Objects. If I go ahead and select these vectors here, click on the icon there, I can see I've got various choices here. If I literally just want a vector that actually represents the outer silhouette of these shapes, which in this case would be what I would use to cut this part out, then I'm going to uncheck the Offset Boundary option, make sure I have none of the options selected in here, and just hit Create. 
If we just close this now, it may be a little hard to see on the screen, but that's created a vector which is selected around the outside of the part. If I just right mouse click, move that to a new layer and call that layer cut out and hit OK and then we'll just switch off layer 1 you can see the vector that was created there so that's the vector that I could now use in order to cut the part out in addition to that though if we go back to layer 1 what I could do here is take that use the same command but this time specify an offset boundary so that I have enough room to do a pocket toolpath that I know is going to cut out around the letters um, and the star here so we'll go ahead and hit create and close now when I did my pocketing toolpath I could select my letters the stars and that outer boundary and I know I'd pocket down the oval and around the letters and be able to come back in and do the cutout pass as well one other option that can be useful in some cases here if you don't want to um, exactly follow the shape like this if we delete that is to select these come back into the same command and this time create a rubber band boundary so if we hit create you can see there that's just going to kind of go round as if it's sort of stretching a rubber band around the outside of this joining up the various sort of corners it finds with a straight line again this is also applying the offset that we've got set in here as well as well as for the application that I've shown you here for certain sets of overlapping vectors um, when you come to nest them if you want to keep them in their exact orientation that you've got them it can be beneficial to create a boundary like this um, in effect as a way of sort of containing those shapes so that they can be nested um, keep kept within their original positions and then you can just delete that boundary afterwards once they've been nested so nice useful command again there would have been sort of manual ways to achieve some of these things in previous versions but this is going to uh, definitely dramatically improve the speed at which you can do this when it's required last thing I want to show you with regard to the sort of 2d drawing um, import side of vCarve Pro and Aspire is a new set of options that have been added to help dramatically improve the ability to process files that were created in the SketchUp software program. Let's just bring up a screenshot here and you can see this is a screenshot of SketchUp. Uh, this is a design program that can be used to lay out assemblies for things like furniture, cabinets, many other parts. It's used by architects and woodworkers and lots of different applications. Um, the tricky part comes when you want to go from the assembly you've got in SketchUp to then actually start to create data that you can easily cut on a CNC machine. Typically you may have a part like you've got here which needs to be cut out of um, sheet goods so you want to be able to bring this in and then divide up all the individual pieces make that geometry um, such that it's easy to then lay out nest and create toolpaths on and that's what these new options help you to do. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail in the video here. I'd recommend looking at the What's New document for a more thorough um, set of instructions regarding this and much of those are going to be much more familiar to you if you are a SketchUp user. So here I'm just going to minimize the image there. Let's create a new file. We'll just go for a sort of 8 foot by 4 foot sheet. Go ahead and hit OK. What I'm going to do is import the SketchUp file for that wall cabinet you saw there. This actually came from a tutorial disk and details of that are contained in the What's New document. The What's New document is available on the website. Also you can go to Help and What's New and that will bring up the PDF there in order to get more information about any of the features that you've seen here. To access the SketchUp options, you're just going to use the standard file import command, so import vectors from a file. If we just go into a folder, we can see I have some SketchUp files here. They're denoted by a .skp extension. So this is the wall cabinet that I just showed you a screenshot of. When you select a .skp file and hit open, the software is automatically going to bring up this form that you can see here so that you can make choices about how you want to import the data. So you can see there are a lot of modifiers in this form. 
The most basic choice though that you make is whether you want an exploded flat layout where the software is going to try and pull apart the design and lay out all the different component pieces or whether you literally just want like a technical drawing of it which is the three views front top side. If we select that first of all and I just hit OK then you can see what that's brought in is every single one of the components or the, the objects that was in SketchUp here and it's just laid those out uh, in my 2D view. It has divided them up onto layers that you can see here and they have been picked up from however the layers were created inside of SketchUp itself. Now you could take and start pulling this apart, editing it and getting it ready to machine or it may be that you'd actually like to have the software try and help you with that process in which case if we come up here, select the same file and say exploded flat layout and now I have a few different choices. I can either auto orient the files so that the largest face becomes the top face or if you've pre-prepared the file in SketchUp by shading the face that you want to be on the top of the material then you can ask the software to organize it by that method. As I say there are a number of other um, options you can choose in here for instance we can um, take the polygons that are created by SketchUp when you've got circles and arcs and um, either VCarve Pro or Aspire will try to refit those back to circles and arcs. Um, also you've got different options here depending how you want things like the components, the groups to be handled. Again the detail for these is really contained in the What's New document. The last part of the form allows you to only pick certain things from uh, the design so perhaps we want to only import visible data on certain layers and that might mean that we uncheck a particular layer to choose not to bring the data in on that um, layer as it was created in SketchUp. And in this case I'm just going to auto orientate with specified a gap of one inch. If I hit OK you can see now that rather than bring in something that effectively looks like a technical drawing what I've got is a whole bunch of separate parts here and this would make it much easier for me to now do any additional editing I wanted to these for instance adding things like dog bone fillets to them for assembly um, or maybe making sure that certain vectors are joined together. Uh, in order to get them ready for machining, making sure I've got closed vectors for pockets and things like that. But that this has dramatically helped me to shortcut the process if I'd had to do it manually by dividing this up in SketchUp first and exporting all the separate pieces from there. Again, I've got the benefit of the layers to help me here. And as I say, while this is not effectively going to automatically process every single file you save perfectly, the more you learn about how you might set the files up in SketchUp, the quicker that this process should be. And certainly initially here we've had some excellent feedback from customers who are SketchUp users on how much this is helping them with their um, taking their designs to get them ready for manufacture. You can also use this part to demonstrate another change that's been made to the zoom command when using the F or F6 shortcut keys on the keyboard. If I just come over and resize the part we're working with here so it's 12 by 12 and hit OK. Now the vectors we've got don't fit entirely within the part here. Previously in the software if I hit F or F6 on the keyboard it would zoom to the extent of my job space here so I'd no longer be able to see all the vectors around the outside of this. Now the default uh, for hitting F or F6 is that it will zoom to all the vectors even if they lie outside of my part. If I want it to just zoom to the job area then I need to hold down shift and then hit F or F6 and now it will zoom in to the job area itself. As I said the default for F or F6 on its own is to zoom to the extents of the vectors and another option that's been added now if I want to zoom in on a particular object if I select it is to hold down control and then hit F or F6 and the software will automatically zoom to the selected objects. So that's a really nice enhancement um, for navigating around your work. So that's a combination of either F or F6 as a shortcut key to zoom and then adding the shift or control modifiers depending what you want to zoom in on. If I just hit F here what I'm going to do is hit control A to select everything and then just hit delete on the keyboard and now if I zoom we'll go to the work area because we have no vectors within the job. 
So that covers the enhancements that have been made in the drawing, layout and import section of the program, essentially the 2D parts of VCarve Pro and Aspire. Now let's go ahead and look at the changes that were made in the toolpaths um, for VCarve Pro 7.5 and Aspire 4.5. Let's create some geometry now that will help us look at improvements that have been made to the pocketing algorithm. What I want to do is uh, draw a rectangle here. I'm just going to click and drag this and I'm going to make it exactly a quarter of an inch wide and hit apply. Let's also create a rectangle over here of an arbitrary size and I'm going to offset that outwards by a quarter of an inch as well. We'll create sharp corners for that there. Now previously in VCarve Pro and Aspire, if we were to go ahead and pocket these shapes where you've got a distance between the lines which is the same as the tool geometry we plan to use, then you may not have got very desirable results because it causes um, a problem when the software comes to calculate things which are effectively dividing by an exact number relative to the diameter of the tool. Now some improvements have been made to this, so if we go ahead and tile the windows here, and go over to the toolpaths tab. I'm going to select these vectors. I'm going to click on the icon to create a pocket toolpath. We'll just cut down to a depth of 0.3. Select a quarter inch end mill. So remember, this is the same diameter as the width of these two instances here. And we'll go ahead and hit calculate. Now we can see, if we maximize this, how the software is just going around and it's identified those and it's able to do them in a single pass whereas before we may not have had any result at all or we may have seen it jumping up and down inside the pocket where it was um, unable to identify whether it could fit the tool or not fit the tool so this is a good enhancement for slots and grooves when you're doing a pocketing toolpath if they match the size of your tool geometry now if we want to, we could of course preview this, but we're pretty much just going to see what we'd expect uh, from the geometry and tool that we selected there. Let's hit close now and we'll go up and look at the drilling toolpath, which is the other main area that's seen changes here. So if we click on the icon for the drilling toolpath, the main um, difference that you'll see between this version and the previous versions is under peck drilling if we check that option we now have two different selections we can make previously there was only one selection which was to retract above the top of your material in order to clear chips using the peck drilling now we have an option that will keep the tool in the hole but just lift it up by a small amount above the height of the previous pass and you activate that by checking the option here and specifying a retract gap in the box here in addition to that, there's also a change to the ability to now add a dwell at the bottom of each pass. That will in effect pause the tool at the bottom of the pass for a certain number of section seconds. If I check that and specify that value there, um, then the tool will stay there again in order to just help machining certain materials with certain tooling. It's very important to understand that that option will only be output if the post processor for your machine and the machine itself support the dwell command. So you'd need to make sure that you've got that dwell section in there if you want to take advantage of that. So that concludes the enhancements that are common to both VCarve Pro 7.5 and Aspire 4.5. What I'm going to do now is just go ahead and start a copy of Aspire and show you the modelling changes that have been made which will be specific just to Aspire users. The main change in Aspire is to do with how we import and work with full 3D models. These are the types of models that you may have created in another CAD program, uh, something like Rhino, Silo, um, or a more typical CAD modeler, or they may be files that you've got from the internet, uh, meshes of buildings or machinery or vehicles, figures, something like that. And so we now have some ways where we can um, help to handle these types of designs in the software. So I'll give you an example of this. Let's go ahead and create a new file, which is 12 by 8 and hit OK. I'm going to come down to the modeling tab and then we're going to come up here to the import a component or 3D model icon here. From uh, my folder here I'm going to select a model of an old motorbike 
and the first thing I need to do which is the same as in previous versions is to just uh, orient this so that we get it into the right place so I want to look from the right rotate that around 90 degrees and then adjust the size of this so that it's going to fit inside of my job next if I look down the z-axis here what I may want to do is just uh, center the model there select the zero plane to go at the bottom of it and then we may want to actually tilt that up. When I import it at the moment, I'm just going to get the side profile of this, but I might want to make this look as if the motorbike's sort of coming towards me. So I'm going to choose the interactive rotation option around the Y axis, and then you will just rotate that around there. And we'll go ahead and center that and hit the um, zero plane to the bottom again. Now the biggest change in this form is the addition at the bottom here of this ability to apply perspective along Z. Now it's important that you do all your adjustment in terms of the orientation, size and location that you want the part to be before you apply the perspective. But once you've got that in position as we have here with the motorbike, I can check this option and I can use the slider to basically apply the effect of perspective on the model to sort of give it a bit more pop, make it look a little bit more like it's coming out towards me. Again, this is very subjective how you would use this. We can just slide that back and forward until we're happy with how the model's been distorted there. In this case, I'm going to go with about 90, 92%. And when I'm happy with that, I'm just going to hit OK. Now that's going to import the model as it would have done previously. We can see by adding the tilt and my perspective there, I've created a very, very deep model. Now at this point in time, I've got similar options as I had before in terms of how I might scale this down. So typically in the past, what I would have done is take the model, I'd have clicked on the properties, and it may have been that I actually want to get this down to be, say, a quarter of an inch or three-eighths of an inch. So if I type in 0.25 and hit the space bar, we can see it's reduced the height, but what it's also done is completely washed out the vast majority of the detail in the part here. So if we just close this and I hit Control z to undo that and get it back to the size that it was before, Another new option that's been added to Aspire 4.5 is something called the Emboss Tool. This is the icon you can see here on the end of the second row of icons under Modeling Tools. You need to make sure your component's selected, then we can click on the icon here. And you can see that the software has processed that and applied um, an algorithm so that it scaled it down here at the moment it scaled it down so that it's about 10% of its original height now if we want to we can keep going down so that we make that a lot less so now it's actually below a quarter of an inch we can also apply some smoothing to that if we want so that we can start to blend in some of the details together and so you can see what this is doing is retaining a lot of the detail as we reduce the height of the part down. So almost like sort of grabbing the surface detail of it as it was reduced down there. So now if I hit OK, you can see what we've created here height wise is less than a quarter of an inch, so less than we looked at before, but it's got all the kind of detail that was on the surfaces of the part. Now the results you get from this tool will depend a lot on the model and the type of effects you're trying to generate. Certainly you're going to see that in this case um, the embossing process has not only um, made sure we retain the surface detail but it's also actually created some additional shape based on where the mesh of the triangles was as well. So we certainly need to come in here with the sculpting tools to clean this up. There's other areas as well where you know from a height point of view the um, tyre and uh, other parts of the bike are now at a similar height. So again, we may need to make some separate modifications to this, or it might be that we use a combination of the embossing tool and then also um, the original component that was scaled down as well. So it's important to understand that this is not necessarily going to give you um, an absolutely perfect 3D relief model from an imported 3D part, but in lots of cases it will help you uh, along that process or give you something that will be very usable with a little bit of cleanup um, to add as a component into a design.
I'd encourage you to experiment with this, have a look around on the web. There are some sites where you can get free models for samples and then other places where you can purchase them as well. It's important to work with it though to understand its limitations. And that concludes uh, this overview video where we've discussed the um, additions and enhancements that have been made to VCarve Pro 7.5 and Aspire 4.5 should be noted at this point that if you're running Aspire 4 or VCarve Pro 7 then this is a free upgrade and you can just go to help and check for updates if you want to uh, download this and automatically patch your version of the software so you can access these new features. Thanks for watching.